Well, it looks like uh, we've got a lot of folks on the line today, so um, thank you all for, for joining in. Uh, we're doing a, a little bit of a, of, a, of a field webinar today. We're actually uh, in Richmond. We're live from the uh, RVA Security Conference, RVA SEC Conference that's being held at the VCU uh, campus on the VCU campus. This has been a, a two-day conference uh, around cybersecurity uh, with a, a lot of uh, you know, great speakers and, and um, you know, hands-on demonstrations. I, um, I met with uh, a friend of mine, uh, Paul Southerington, yesterday as he was in the um, Capture the Flag event, which was pretty cool to see uh, uh, people, you know, live hacking uh, and, and solving problems and uh, trying to, to win the prize of who could uh, answer the most questions and overcome the most uh, number of security obstacles to, to, to win the, uh, the prize. Um, so it's been pretty, uh, pretty neat. They also were doing some uh, lock picking at that event as well. Uh, a lot of people that are into cybersecurity are also into physical security. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, Nick, how many folks uh, do you think here here at this event? Looks like been a pretty good turnout. Yeah, I think they kept ticket sales at 800. Wow, that's great. Uh, it's it's nice to see the uh, vibrancy of the uh, the community here. Um, so today on the uh, on the webinar, we've got uh, Richard. Uh, he's a um, uh, Cybersecurity professor, uh, also somebody who's worked with the uh, with the FBI. Uh, Richard, could you give a little background of uh, of yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm returning to teaching, so I currently am the cybersecurity program director over at Piedmont Virginia Community College in Charlottesville. And prior to that, I was the uh, uh, computer scientist for the Washington Field Office for FBI, and before that, I was with uh, Virginia State Police as a computer forensic examiner. Uh, before getting into law enforcement, I worked for Cisco Systems, working the 3G telecommunications and programming uh, those all too familiar IP phones that you see on many people's desks. Richard, I didn't know that you had worked for Cisco. That's that's pretty cool. Um, Nick Kelly, uh, you're with Cisco currently. Uh, Cisco is a partner of ours, um, and uh, we we uh, didn't know that you would be here at the RVA SEC conference. Uh, so it was it was nice to run into a, a familiar uh, face and and, and brand. Um, tell me a little bit about your background. Uh, so Richard and I actually are uh, connected in ways neither of us knew. He worked for Cisco. And my dad actually also worked for the FBI. So we, we kind of, <laughs> I think we sort of flip-flopped <laughs> there. Uh, I am a, a 20 year vet in the InfoSec industry. I've uh, been at Cisco for about five and a half years, came, uh, came aboard with the SourceFire acquisition. And uh, previous to that, I've been in SC at a couple companies. And previous to that, I worked in diplomatic security doing incident response for the State Department. So been doing this a long time and, and uh, very, very happy to uh, talk about some of the things that Cisco is doing specifically to help with automation integration and to get visibility and security for our small and medium business partners. That sounds great. Well, I'm Ian McRae. I'm with Ian Computers. And uh, the, the talk today is cybersecurity threats on small organizations. I'd like to just provide a, a, a quick introduction to Ian Computers. Um, we are based here in Virginia and we support Virginia and Washington DC. We've got a data center in Waynesboro, Virginia and uh, got a substantial uh, presence in, in uh, Richmond, Charlottesville, Harrisonburg and, and also in the district. Um, we are um, really responsible for, for IT for um, about 60 organizations. Uh, we either work to do the IT department functions or we work with a small department to uh, backstop them um, so that they can get great results for their users. It's all about user success. And with security, it's all about making it uh, something that the users and the management doesn't have to you know, go through a, a thousand different uh, 
decisions that we're constantly making uh, incremental improvements so that they're they're secure, uh, and that's just part of our roadmap. Uh, we've been ranked uh, nationally uh, as well as in the state of Virginia, top five uh, managed service providers in the state of Virginia, which we're really proud of. And um, our mission is to really be proactive uh, and be a you know drive value to the users and to the business. Um, so one of the things that uh, that we do is uh, we provide security assessments as uh, as part of it, and um, as part of doing security assessments, we we see you know firsthand some of the uh, the gaps that um, a lot of small businesses have uh, in their um, in their setup. So with that uh, tee up, um, Richard, can you speak about the landscape of uh, of security now for small businesses and some of the concerns that uh, that you're seeing um, in the news, you know, this week and and you know as you as you work with small organizations uh, doing assessments. Sure. Uh, let's see if I get control over that. Yeah. All right, let's see if it comes over to my little presentation. Uh, if not, I can just speak to it. Uh, looks like it won't show my screen. Uh, that's okay. Um, I can go back to it. Okay. <coughs> so, like to, uh, we've all heard about the cybersecurity attack up in Baltimore, right? So in Baltimore, uh, they got hit with the second um, attack in 15 months. So this one is a ransomware attack. The previous attack, it crippled their 911 and 311, the 911 and 311 phone call systems over a busy weekend. But this current attack is a Robinhood ransomware one, and it requests Bitcoin payment to unlock about 4,000 uh, affected machines, and the FBI in Baltimore are refusing to pay the ransomware, obviously. Now, what really is uh, unique about this particular attack is that Baltimore is refusing to pay. Um, and uh, some small companies, they'll say, well, we need our data back and we'll just go ahead and pay for that ransom, which is never really a great idea because you're not totally insured that you're going to get your data back even if you pay. And if you get it paid and you get your systems unlocked, how trustworthy do you think that data is really going to be, right? So with the Baltimore attack right now, um, what's really unique about this one is that the city council is being prepared very well for future attacks as well. They're using this one as a learning um, uh, type of thing because they've gotten hit twice, right? So they've gotten hit in twice in the last 15 months. And so Baltimore city council president is uh, Democrat uh, Brandon Scott. And he's newly appointed by the new uh, Democratic mayor. Uh, and then they also have a Democratic councilman, Eric Costello, and Democratic councilman, Isaac Yitzi Schaefer. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. And they're going to be heading a new city committee to work with the FBI and Homeland Security. And those are uh, designed to prevent future attacks, to learn what uh, occurred during this one, how to prevent future attacks as well. But what's really nice about this committee is that Costello worked for nine years as a senior information technology auditor for the United States Government Accountability Office. So I think that they're really integrating technology into all aspects of their uh, city government right now. And when Baltimore City Council um, President Brandon Scott came on board, he really focused on cybersecurity training and cybersecurity efforts. And this was before the first attack. So about two hmm. years ago, he started implementing a larger budget. It was about a half a million dollars. And unfortunately, that entire budget didn't go through. So it wasn't used completely. And part of that budget was 32 training opportunities uh, that were supposed to be implemented citywide for all employees. And there are no records right now through Freedom of Information Act that display that those trainings actually occurred, 
we do know that some trainings occur, but not all 32. Uh, it also created several positions. Um, I know of at least three that were created as part of that budget, specifically targeting cybersecurity efforts to try to tighten the network and the communication systems to try to prevent any type of attack. Now, as we know, those were not successful. And we're trying to learn what actually occurred and what were the short calls at that one. But we do know that this current one had crippled the network and you may have read about some of the efforts with the um, real estate transactions going on right now. With uh, Baltimore City, they have a lot of sales going on of different houses, different apartments, whatever you have. And what really has occurred right now is that they're working with pen and paper right now, going manually through records, not using their crippled computer systems. Now, in a process that would normally take about half an hour is trying to, with a computerized system, is now taking three to five times as long. So you're going to be spending many, many hours there looking up records, who has ownership of certain deeds and properties, and if there are any liens on that property. And this is a big part right now, is that Baltimore, to try to cope with this, they have people signing an affidavit that says that there are no known liens on that property. And you can imagine how people are used to online bill pay, online banking, to try to keep, treat, try to keep track of those records. Now, if they're going back to paper and pencil and saying, here's a sheet of paper that says, I'm going to sell this property and I promise that there's no liens on that property, it can be pretty daunting if you're a buyer of that property and not knowing whether or not you're going to be able to have your property insured. And so a lot of insurance companies right now are refusing to insure properties in Baltimore knowing that the deed transfer may not be legitimate if there's a lien on that property or if the person selling it is not the true owner. And we've really relied on computers to look up those records. And it's really easy to use a computer to do a search, right? And to just search for something, we've all used Google to try to find something. We're not going in through an encyclopedia or a dictionary. It's easy just to look something up. Now with these network systems, the reason why Baltimore got crippled is that all these systems were interconnected. And we do that you know, for convenience, right? We wanna be able to connect from one computer system to the other. Now, these systems were not isolated from one another. So for example, the real estate office was not disconnected from the bill payment office and was not disconnected from another type of office within the city. They're all controlled by the same IT department. They're all managed by the same IT department, which is great, but they did not have any controls put in place to separate each of these departments. So when this Robin Hood, um, that's the name of the malware that affected them, it tried to uh, spread itself. Now, when it does spread, um, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with the Robin Hood malware, but it executes a sc.exe stop command. And what this does is it stops 181 Windows services at once um, by issuing this uh, complex command there. And what it does is it stops the antivirus, database, mail server, and many other different types of software programs that are running. It's kind of like just killing individual processes on a computer. And so what this tries to do is stop your antivirus from trying to, of course, uh, stop its spread. It stops any database programs that are running for any files that are in use. and also stops your connection to the mail server so that way it's able to encrypt your email communication and also infect that mail server if possible. Now the intent is to close all those files so they can be encrypted without an error condition of those files being open and in current use. Now it also tries to stop the network. So it stops any network shares. Uh, so that way it can target those individual computers and encrypt them one at a time without having to try to slow down or duplicate efforts for trying to encrypt network attack drives or shares. So it uses this payload through the do Windows domain controller or it uses a PowerShell or PS exec to try to transmit them from one computer to the other. And this is really effective on there. And so what you see on these ransomwares, especially through Robinhood, 
is that there's different ransomware payments. One ransom asks for three Bitcoins per machine or 13 Bitcoins for an entire affected network. And with Baltimore with a reported over 4,000 infected machines, you can imagine that wow. 13 Bitcoins would just be a simple payment rather than three times 4,000, right? But these ransom notes are typically just standard HTML files that are displayed on those affected machines. And they inform the user that they've been infected and then instruct them on how to submit payment. Now, this one is not the most ruthless, but it is a really aggressive type of ransomware type of program that's out there. And what it does is it has an RSA key in, that's stored in Windows temp uh, slash pub dot key. And this is a key area to look for. And that would have an AES encryption method that uses that key to infect that user's machine's files. So what we could do is just to try to prevent our systems from being infected is just to simply look and see Windows temp and have a pub dot key and if you already have a key in there, if your system gets infected, it's going to be using that RSA key in there. So if you get infected for whatever reason from this, you can actually have your own decryption key available. So that's why I would recommend for any system that right now doesn't have any protection against the uh, Robinhood virus is to put your own pub.key in that Windows temp file. So that way, if your system does get infected by this, it will uh, you'll have your backdoor key for it. Well, our team has been uh, really working with uh, our customers over the past couple of years and uh, with a, a series of administrative controls and self audits. Uh, I always find these ransomwares, it's like the, um, it, it's like the outside world is auditing IT's work from, from afar. And uh, when, when IT fails, they haven't been doing the, uh, the, the right administrative um, techniques to, to secure their systems, um, you know, then, then you've got to pay the ransom. But if you're, if you're doing the right things, you have a backup, you, you've got the right administrative controls in place, the right, the right tools, the right processes, um, you know, you're in a much better position and, and uh, not in a situation where you're paying a ransom. Um, that's really good information, Richard. Thank you for that. Uh, Nick Kelly, I, I know Cisco has been a, a big part of our success story with, um, you know, getting a ransomware uh, taken care of. Tell me a little bit more about some of the products that uh, the, that uh, we work with you on, uh, OpenDNS, uh, Meraki, and, and also the, the Duo product is one that we're really working to roll out um, right now. Um, tell us a little bit more about some of those products. Yeah, great. Thank you, Ian and, and Richard for that information. That's, if you think about, uh, you know, the fact that a mortgage for a lot of people is the biggest investment they'll ever make, that, that's a pretty telling that everybody's on pen and paper. Um, so I do want to do want to talk to you about the Cisco stuff. I also will tell you that there are some steps that, that Cisco doesn't have products to, uh, to help out with. And, and there's a whole set of guidelines on FBI.gov around ransomware for things like uh, asset life cycle management patching, having backups, that kind of stuff. But when it comes to uh, security, and, and even before we get to security, when it comes to visibility, because every security tool is a visibility tool, right? Um, <clears throat> what we want to do is we want to provide uh, layers of visibility and security for all of our, our, our clients. And so uh, when we, let's talk specifically about a couple of little things that we have acquired and have built out over the last number of years here at Cisco because we both do in-house development as well as acquisition. And um, we'll start with Duo. Duo is our most recent acquisition. If everybody is familiar with multi-factor authentication, that's what Duo provides. And, and we're able to implement that both for physical networks as well as for cloud networks. So if you have a, a group that's moving to the, to the cloud inside of your organization, we can, we can help provide policy enforcement there. What we do essentially with two-factor authentication is it's, it's your identity plus something that you know, right? Like your password. And then the second thing is something that you have. That's the second factor of authentication. And so what we, what we do typically with Duo is we set up a, a push notification on your phone the same way for a lot of folks, if you're familiar with logging into Google or Facebook, where you get a code that's pushed out to your phone. Um, and that's one of the, probably the, the most common deployment mechanism that we have. Uh, we have a number of different flexible ways to do it. I have a MacBook with a, a touchpad and actually we can set it up with your fingerprint as your second uh, 
your second factor for authentication. So there's a lot of flexibility around that. And what that provides is parallel policy enforcement. So let's say that you, uh, if, if you're leveraging something like Exchange Online from Office 365, Microsoft's got a great set of visibility into that environment, but Microsoft has no way to make the same policy enforced in a, a cloud-based environment as well as on your physical environment. You need something else to do that. Also, if you're doing multi-cloud adoption, let's say you've got, um, you know, your email in Microsoft's cloud, but maybe you're doing something with Amazon in their cloud. In each of those organizations, it's good at covering their own deployments, but no visibility across multiple clouds, right? So that's one of the other use cases that we have, which is being able to have visibility and parallel policy enforcement across both. Um, Richard's scenario that he brought up with Baltimore, which is very, very real, um, from a ransomware perspective, is something else that we can help out with. So we acquired uh, a couple of companies, Mobus Meraki, which is uh, an excellent set of network and security devices that we have. The uh, most common deployment we have with those is a lot of times is uh, access points, wireless access points. And uh, another company that we acquired was OpenDNS. And OpenDNS is essentially um, providing security for all of your users, anybody who's going anywhere on the internet. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about how that works and I'll talk about how that work, those two things work together and then I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Ian. So DNS is leveraged by every device on the planet. It, it, think of it as your, your contact list in your phone, right? You probably have a bunch of names in there but you probably don't have everybody's names memorized. So you put your contact in your phone. If I'm gonna call Ian, Ian, it's not uh, Ian that comes back, it's Ian's phone number, right? So same thing with DNS, DNS is I've put in Cisco.com and it brings back an IP address. What we do with OpenDNS, what we do with well, what we now call Cisco Umbrella, which is the same technology, is when we bring back that IP address, we also bring back all of the security information we have about that IP address. So if that domain has been associated with a malware campaign, if that domain has been associated with phishing campaigns, command and control traffic, uh, if the person who registered that domain also has other domains that they've registered and they're associated with malware. If the server that's hosting that domain actually hosts files that we know are malicious, like a, a ton of different information and then we give it a score and based on the score, we can actually enforce policy. And that's one of the things that, that Ian's gonna be able to do for you um, with their, their team of proactive uh, engineers and analysts, right? So we, we can do all that. One of the biggest benefits we have to that is for domains that have fallen into the malware category, those are typically users who click on something that they've been fooled by and they get the machine infected. So we can actually prevent that initial infection. When we have command and control traffic, the malware may exist on the computer. It may be an infected asset, but when it's calling out to get its instructions, we can actually block that traffic because yes, the malware exists on the computer, that's bad, but if the computer can't get the instructions to do things like send out keystrokes that it's been logging or grab that encryption key and encrypt the disk, then it's still relatively self-contained in the organization. So it's a little less uh, from a severity perspective. So we can, we can do prevention with the malware categories. We can do containment with the command and control categories just for a couple different use cases. And then we can also do things like URL filtering and, and, um, and also uh, application visibility so we can see what apps are in use in the environment. So if you have moved everything to, let's say, uh, Box for collaboration, but you have these six users who are still using Dropbox, we may want to go talk to those six users and explain to them, you know, what the corporate policy is. Um, the other thing that we can do is we can tie that, those, those policies that we create within Umbrella to our Meraki access points. And we do that very, very simple. It's an API key that, uh, that you know, the folks at Ian can set up for you. And when we do that, we create our policies inside of Umbrella and those policies get populated into Meraki. So we have the ability to enforce a policy from a user, a user group, or even a wireless uh, SSID, right? And that's useful for, for typical scenarios like if we have a small hospital where we want to create a policy that blocks all of the security categories that we're concerned about. So uh, again, now we're command control, crypto mining, those types of things. Um, but also for our employees who are on our our organization's uh, network, we want to also put in things like, let's block the time killer applications. Let's block gaming, let's block, let's block uh, you know, maybe Facebook, those types of things. However, if I've got a guest Wi-Fi, I still wanna give them the security controls 
but I don't necessarily care if my guests are on gaming sites or on Facebook, right? So I can have a less stringent policy that applies to them. And we do all that on the back end, again, through, through a key that has the umbrella policies created and then put into, into Meraki and, the, and the, again, that configuration is something that the folks at Yen can help out with. So those are just a couple of examples of, of technologies that we have that can help with uh, some of the malware and ransomware campaigns that we're seeing, that the, the, the types of things that Richard talked about. And I will, uh, I'll hand it back over to you, Ian, if there's any follow up there. Yeah. Yeah, Nick, that was a, a good overview. Uh, I just wanted to share when, when the ransomware started to emerge uh, close to five years ago now, uh, you know, we had a user training uh, strategy with it because a lot of it just boils down to, to users being uh, tricked through phishing, clicking on the wrong thing, inviting the malicious uh, uh, actors in. Um, but we found that you know, we just couldn't change user behavior fast enough. We had to do something more. And uh, OpenDNS really uh, enabled us to, um, the Cisco Umbrella platform really enabled us to do do that. Um, and, and like you were saying, you, you know, we load, load that on all of the machines that we're managing. So when, when people, you know, we're all human, we all make mistakes, we click on the thing that, uh, you know, we think is gonna be that, that new price list or the, uh, the, the joke that our friend is sending us. Um, when we make those mistakes, the Cisco umbrella uh, agent really blocks that from happening if it's a managed laptop and it, it blocks it, whether it's happening uh, at the coffee shop uh, or at the, uh, at the corporate headquarters. Um, and then with the integration of that tool into the, um, the wireless infrastructure, the, the Meraki uh, wireless access points, uh, we even can offer that level of protection to uh, guests that are visiting our our office, you know, the uh, the accountant that's coming in and, and doing the audit for for two days and is working on the guest, you know, wireless. Uh, we don't have to worry about that person that has brought their own device and is working on premise from uh, somehow gumming up our network or or um, infecting uh, files that they might be interacting with, uh, you know, our our team. So that's been just really helpful um, and. The, the big breakthrough that I realized here at this uh, conference, RVA Sec, and um, maybe Richard, you can speak a little bit to this. And but Nick's tools um, with Duo, you know, everybody's going to the cloud. We've got, um, you know, and, and Nick, you were also mentioning how we often have multiple cloud platforms, and these cloud platforms they're natively accessible, you know, anywhere in the world. And, uh, but a lot of the, the, the management techniques of how we set up our users and manage passwords and those types of things are being uh, grandfathered in from, from uh, you know, security paradigms when, when uh, you know, people were only accessing uh, our applications within the, the boundaries of the, of the four walls of the, of the office. Um, so one of the things I was seeing is just how, uh, how insecure those cloud-based applications are um, when, when uh, you know, the password policies are, uh, are lax. Um, so we've been migrating to the, the Duo, the two-factor authentication, um, because then it really uh, secures us from the phishing and also from lax passwords. Uh, you know, our users can't accidentally give up their passwords as easily through a phishing campaign. Uh, and, and also, if, if somebody has a lax password or they, they have, uh, unbeknownst to IT, use that password across a lot of different platforms, and one of those platforms is breached, the, uh, the two-factor authentication still keeps their cloud-based uh, application secure. Um, we were learning here at this conference unit you know, just how devastating uh, when, when somebody's email gets breached. You know, just think about all the files we email, um, and, and then the ability for our email to be used to uh, also, um, you know, get people within our teams to, uh, you know, click on things and, and, and further that uh, spread of infection. Um, Richard, you were mentioning how quickly you could, uh, you could crack a, a typical password. Um, I was hearing here at this conference how, um, uh, you know, gentleman was cracking like 27 passwords with an organization that had a, a like a, a, a an eight character password limit. You know, they were changing their passwords every uh, every month or every two months, but they were they were only eight characters, and uh, he was able to to get all 
uh, like he was able to get 24 out of 27 passwords cracked in a in a pretty short amount of time. How how long does it take to really crack some of these uh, shorter passwords? Well, we can use Rainbow Tables in um, uh, Rainbow Crack is a free utility that's out there that uses a rainbow table of pre-computed values of all possible combinations within you know like an eight character set or something like that. Um, and those to go through is extremely quick. So if you even have a cell phone using that, you can typically go through an eight character password and crack about 90% of them in under three minutes. So that's extremely quick, even using the computing power of just a cell phone wow. to be able to do that. So my personal uh, then, passwords are about 20 characters long, and uh, that would take a supercomputer eons to compute. So uh, I think that those are very, very uh, worthwhile to use. Yeah, I was hearing that setting a, a minimum of somewhere around 12 characters for your users is it would it's really important. And then the, the way these tools work, how do they uh, how do they prioritize uh, you know that uh, cracking process to to shorten the time? A lot of them will try to break it into uh, well-known words, and so I was able to crack into a system using social engineering methods, and that's usually the easiest way to do that. So I did a proof of concept yesterday for a, um, a state of Virginia, and I can't obviously mention which one it was, but was able to get into that one in under two minutes using um, just some information that was supplied by a user uh, through social engineering methods. I was able to crack through that password, reset all the information, reset the email contact communication, uh, even the user ID, in under two minutes. Yeah, some years back, we uh, we walked into a situation where we were uh, assessing a network, and we found out that it was breached and was being uh, used to send out uh, spam email and and used as a hop off point for uh, you know other uh, illegal activity. And we determined that the password, this is a, a small equipment dealership, and the, the password, uh, the administrative password was the, the name of the dealership that they were representing. You know, it was, uh, it, it, it was uh, you know, just anyone who, you know, that's, the, that's what's on the big sign out by the road is the password. So, uh, yeah, you, you prioritize those types of things. I hear that some of the most common, uh, common passwords are the, the, the season, and the year together, and uh, you put those passwords up at the top of the list and you get in pretty quickly. Yeah, especially when uh, people leave the default passwords. You can think about your home uh, routers in many uh, residential areas, it's still admin and admin. And uh, by default, uh, Verizon has been turning off, and Comcast has been doing this as well, by turning off their remote administration for those. But if you do a port scan on those, you'll notice that those remote administrative uh, ports are currently open for those Verizon techs to get in through a back door. Well, this has been uh, really good information. So just want to open the floor up uh, if anyone has any questions. Uh, got some, some really expert minds on the, on the call today. Uh, I think most people are still on mute, so just want to check to see if your uh, question, if you're trying to ask the question, if you're currently on mute. Good point, Richard. Let me, uh, uh, Ian, if it's cool, let me just add in one thing since everybody is uh, sort of coming off mute and everything in the in the meantime. Yeah, I know a lot of times we do with 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 small businesses, the, the mindset is, you know, we're, we're too small. No one's going to target us. Our information's not that valuable, but I, but I'll, I will say this in organizations of That's almost, the most. They've been here almost oh, every yeah, size, years. I mean, it's, it's just up to the existing contract. You're uh you're going to have somebody in the organization whose job it is, is to open resume.pdf and invoice.pdf and it, regardless of how small you are. Right. So it, as long as those, users exist, then there's still a potential threat, right? So what our goal is to make sure that we understand what those files actually are, where they came from, who they've been associated with, where we've seen them before, globally and locally, uh, and to just provide, again, as much intelligence and visibility about that as possible, right? So don't, 
I, I, even, you know, even uh, a consumer user don't ever think that, you know, you can just turn the other cheek and make sure you know, them just to have the mindset that you're not uh, in scope in, in terms of a, a malware campaign. If I could just piggyback on to what Nick was saying there is that in um, Virginia particularly is that we are a huge target for cybersecurity attacks. And even though Virginia is the number one employer for cybersecurity positions worldwide, overtaking Israel and also uh, overtaking um, California as of last year. But with small businesses, they are also a frequent target because they don't have large dedicated IT staff. I think that's a, a really great way that uh, Ian's company, uh, Ian Computers, can really help out these small companies in trying to uh, secure their networks. Now, why would organizations want to get into uh, Virginia-based uh, businesses? Why, why Virginia? Why not Ohio? Uh, it's because of the network infrastructure that Virginia has. We have extremely fast network connections, especially supporting the Northern Virginia, D.C. areas, the military infrastructure in the Hampton Roads area, and the data centers in Central Virginia, and also the medical uh, areas that are popping up in the Roanoke area. Virginia has a very strong telecommunications network already built in as an infrastructure that places like the Midwest just don't, do not have at the current time. Huh. So is the thinking that, uh, you know, is it kind of like what we saw with the target breach some years back where if I get into, uh, you know, that, that small HVAC mechanical firm that might be, you know, servicing bigger companies, and I can use that as a, as a step off point to get into the patent office or to get into, you know, Department of Defense or, or some other bigger entity. Is that kind of what, what the malicious uh, actors are looking to do? Sure. And what we've seen with the Baltimore one is they go for the low hanging fruit, the ones that are not really well defended or they have those PEBCAC issues problem exists between keyboard and chair, where it's a user that will <laughs> click on one of those PDFs or infected email or something like that that gets infected. And with the network systems, you see that it spreads from one department to the other very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, uh, we were learning some of the best practices here about how to compartmentalize, uh, you know, networks and information so that, uh, you know, really spending the time with people to understand you know, what level of access uh, each, you know, user category needed and, and making it so that, you know, everyone didn't view everything um, was, was really key administratively to prevent uh, all sorts of problems. I mean, even disgruntled employee problems um, so that somebody can't walk out with your, uh, your customer list or, or more financial information. It, it doesn't have to be somebody in China that is, that, that you're worried about it. It could often be just, you know, the, the same old problems that uh, your business people have faced all along just with new technology. It's kind of funny. Um, I, I, uh, I ran three uh, cyber patriot teams for the uh, Civil Air Patrol down in Lynchburg. And we went through, you, you mentioned the uh, rainbow tables. Even my son did a, uh, his computer science project as a sophomore in high school using rainbow tables and, and, and pass the hash and was able to come and break almost every one of the passwords in my office um, in a weekend. And, uh, you know, he was like 15. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. He was, so I taught him well, but he was like 15. And we, we set up, uh, my Cyber Patriot guys, we, uh, we set up a Wi-Fi pineapple and uh, made a uh, uh, picture, you know, web page that just looked like McDonald's. And, uh, you know, we weren't supposed to, but we could then see people log in all day long and, and nobody ever knew any difference. And, you know, these guys were, you know, 13 to 18 year olds. It's, uh, it's uh, very frightening when you find out how easy it is. <laughs> huh. Wow, Carl, that's a, that's a really interesting perspective. Um, thank you for sharing that. Well, I want to thank everybody who's uh, joined the webinar and our speakers and everyone who's participated. Uh, you know, these are complex topics and uh, I just want to encourage us all that, that uh, you know, it, it, is not, uh, it is not hopeless. It is something that uh, 
we absolutely can get through. And the way we've done it at Eating Computers is by allowing our team members to specialize, those that are you know, really passionate about security to uh, you know, really specialize in that, and then to develop, develop uh, standards that we can self-audit to. We've got clients coming on board every month and everybody comes to us with uh, you know, different level of maturity. We have some clients that are uh, in really good shape, some that aren't, um, but most of them are right in the middle. And um, you know, one client might have a, a gap in an area where another one doesn't. We just need to audit the networks and have a continuous improvement mindset so that we can get everybody to the same uh, same level of security and, and have it be predictable for them so that they, they, they know they're in a good place and that as requirements change that we can change with the, the times and get them to a good place, you know, next, next year, next quarter, um, those types of things. Um, so I, I just want to encourage everybody to, uh, uh, you know, think about it as continuous improvement and, and we can definitely uh, get your business to the next level. Uh, it doesn't involve buying all new equipment. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not insurmountable. And uh, that's what so many of uh, our, our, our local uh, customers that we work with uh, throughout the state of Virginia have, have found that uh, you know, we, can, we can help them get there. Um, and we've done that for um, you know, recognizable names like the Virginia Military Institute or the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Uh, as, as well as, um, you know, the organization that's right around the corner. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, please feel free to reach out to us if, if you have any um, questions about cybersecurity or anything to do with IT. Um, and we really appreciate uh, Richard and, and Nick uh, presenting today and, and sharing their knowledge. If there's no other questions, then I'll, I'll conclude and thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, for, thanks very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.